Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 176. Buddhism, Bias, and Racism. All right. Okay, greetings. I want to share today something about America. And that has to do with America and racism. Because all the disasters and the catastrophes that have been ha that are happening to America now are only able to happen because of racism. And I want to be clear that I don't mean that all Trump's people are racist any more than I'm a racist. It's just to be clear. I'm not saying they are racist and I'm nice or anybody else is. The point is that there is a structural racism in our country still. We are still the privileged white people who are at home here, we feel. And we don't feel sort of on edge all the time because someone is, could just get us just because of who we are. Because we're the, we're the, we have been the majority you know, race, which is an expanded definition of white. Right, originally the Irish and the Italians, blah, blah, were not white. So white is sort of like, means cool. And there's a lot to do about that. I'm going to do some very longer podcasts as I get more trained. But I only want to say today that the people who are being reckless and destructive and not without realizing it, waving the American flag, are destroying America by supporting a person who is not one of them, who is the absolute capitalist class, who has been oppressing them himself totally, and in the White House is oppressing them, giving himself a tax cut and giving them no jobs program, taking away their health, for their health, health plan, you know, uh, giving them nothing actually. But but they are still behind him because they don't understand that he is confusing them, that their enemies are immigrants. Uh, people of, who are different from them, you know, black people, Lat Latinx people, you know, other kinds of people. And or people maybe who are gay, who are trans, who are lesbian, who are whatever, atheists, whatever it is. Some, they're confusing them. So their actual enemy is sitting on top of them and they are yay, loudly supporting their enemy, this guy who is doing the work of our international enemies, who are tired of America being the world power, such as Russia and China. And he is taking apart our, the system whereby we have influence over the world and we inspire the world to try democracy and pluralism and melting pot and you know joy and beauty and Hollywood and whatever, you know, fantasies, Disney. Right? He, they are destroying that. And, you know, all the while, they, their kids are watching Disney, you know. And they, they're shouting about, you know, waving that red, white, and blue flag. You know, the white is only one-third of the flag. The red is the native people. The, the blue is really black. You know, dark blue and black is really the same thing. So that is the real essence of America, is the meeting of those three races. And there really should be a little yellow border if we were smart. We would know about that, but we don't know that. You know, that's the Chinese type of people, you know. And uh, in, uh, in esoteric Buddhist teaching, you know, the Kala Chakra Buddha has black face, red face, white face, and a yellow face. The black one can verge with dark blue, you know. And so those are the colors 
of the races on the planet, the main ones. You know, there's sort of grays and browns in between, but those are the main ones. And, um, and when everybody can identify with all of them as a human being, it's when we will have reached Shambhala, actually. That's, what it, that's really what it means, to fact that. And this is a little you know, maybe over the head of some people. It might be strange, the idea that, but you know, meditate yourself as uh, being black until you sort of feel what it feels like. It's really nearly impossible if you're white or red or yellow. But, with you, but if you try it and you develop strong concentration, you can develop your empathy, you can develop, you can develop the resilience of identity. You won't be so rigid in your sense of identity. Anyway, the structural definition of racism just means that we still benefit, we inherit, we feel at home, comfortable on the street, we don't feel nervous, well, we do feel nervous when we see a cop because we often are speedy, but, but we don't feel nervous just, just going, being law-abiding and just because we have the wrong skin color in this country. And we, we could be beaten up, we could be killed, actually, just from driving down the street if we sort of looked the wrong way or had the wrong tone of voice or whatever it was. Or some bad guy was in a bad mood. That, then when you live in a country like that, you feel insecure all the time. And you are insecure. And you have a bad, worse education and worse livelihood. And everything is worse lifespan, life expectancy. Worse health care. I mean, you're, you're generally worse off. And so in the sense that we feel comfortable in that kind of culture. I read this work by a lady named D'Angelo, who's a sociologist, and she called it, it's a book about white fragility, about how whites have difficulty facing the structural racism that they are all participant in. Me, they, we are all participant in. I'm one of them. Although I like to say that I feel I'm pink rather than white. I, say, I think that people are blotchy pink, people who have less pigment in their skin because of living in a, in a northern climate. But, but that's just a joke, you know. And I also profit and privilege and benefit by the white, whiteness, you know. And my ancestors had slaves. And my ancestors, you know, like, created this situation. But there is the ideal. There you go. However, you know, so my ancestors created this and their houses were built by slaves. And their white house was, and that, you know, we should this, this White House is an abomination. Jesse Jackson was absolutely right. He wanted to paint it rainbow colors, like that bridge in the Golden Gate Bridge off San Francisco. He wanted to paint it multicolored, make it more cheerful. Like, you know, the Parthenon in ancient Greece was painted in many colors. We have this stupid idea about the Greeks that everything was all, you know, lily white, but it wasn't. It was multicolored. And, um, you know, they have painted those things, but the paint has worn off. So we just paint with white paint, that's silly. You know, but it was because the way they were when we started this country. But at least there is the ideal that there should be equality, that there could be something like a civil rights movement, that there was a reconstruction before it was undone by the evil people in the last part of the 19th century, putting up those statues. And they tried to put the Jim Crow thing back and they put in Jim Crow laws. And we still are to have Jim Crow in prison, too many black people in prison, because we didn't educate them, didn't allow them an equal housing and livelihood and education, and therefore more of them were desperate, and therefore they were more arrested rather than educated, and that's really terrible. Then the prisons don't even educate them, just punish them and, and torture them in, in subtle ways, and not so subtle ways. So we really have to cure this racism thing so that everyone will be sensible and harmonious. And you know, all of the things we invented here in America, and actually our victory even in wars had to do with the fact that somehow all our people, like the Japanese in the last World War, they fought in our army, even though we arrested all their families in a racist suspicion of them, which we didn't do to the Germans and the Italians, although the, the, the Mussolini and Hitler were also our enemy, not only Tojo. But we only arrested all the Japanese because they look different because of racism. So we do these confused and irrational things. But we won the wars because everybody joined. You know, you know, we had anti-Semitic country clubs and golf courses and universities and what have you. 
and yet the Jews fought in the war for us. And then later we might think, oh, we want to, we want to save the Jews from the, from the Nazis, but that isn't the case. We are, our whole country is full of Nazis, it was full of Nazis itself. But they still fought in our war. Because, because of this one thing, we have this ideal that we should try to get over this kind of thing. Get over this rigidness of identity. And the, this D'Angelo book called about white fragility and about racism and how to deal with it. And her, her brave work is to go and consult for companies that want more creativity. So they want to get over the racism and so on. Or they want to try to ameliorate it, at least lessen it. And we have, that's a constant work. It's something that's been in place for centuries. And so it takes time. But we still have it. Even those of us who are very liberal and if we misunderstand racism, she brilliantly analyzes how people misunderstand thinking that it's something a bad person has because they act in some bad way. But she doesn't, that's not what it really means. What it means is participate in a system that is bad. And then within the system that is bad, there are those who think the system was great and they're completely trapped by it. And they're the ones who who were not saying that liberal people or progressive people are like that. They're not. But even they are participant in the system, is what she's making the point. And if, if we want the ones who are acting bad to, to, to overcome their confusion, we have to work on ourselves again and again, more and more of overcoming our structural racism, which is the system which we do participate in, all of us. And it's brilliant what she does, and it's very courageous because what she calls white fragility is where we don't really want to face the system. I myself, reading her book, I was suddenly thinking, you know, there are some Thurmans who had plantation in Mississippi, and that's terrible. And, but, and, but I didn't inherit that plantation. They got wasted in the Civil War, and they're all poor, and you know, there are lots of black Thurmans, but I haven't managed to find them. And maybe I'll try, you know. I, I always have thought I should try, but I never got around to it because of my own struggle to survive as an intellectual, you know, as a, as a humanist intellectual in a country that doesn't prize knowledge, doesn't prize humanism, actually, underpays its school teachers, you know. And, uh, and now we've come to a very dangerous position I'm very optimistic, though, because I really think that what has happened, what this guy did is, is just he's just a crook, you know, who who got into deciding to use the U.S. government for his crimes, you know, and somehow managed to confuse by bringing out the worst in people who were the most confused, uh, but doing what all the previous his predecessors have done to a lesser extent with their dog whistling and so on since Reagan especially intensively, but, but and since the Southern strategy by Nixon in the late 60s, you know, he, he's just done, he's just taken that to the extreme of using race, you know, overt race or, you know, focused conscious race to confuse poor people who are actually being uh, oppressed by their own people of their own race who are using this system to suppress their own poor white people, in fact. And by confusing them that race is the problem, they are able to oppress them even more to, to a revolutionary point where they actually will turn their guns on the government will have a civil war if, they, if it could go on. But luckily, I think it won't go on because we have this ideal and I think we will adopt this work. But I think we liberals who are progressives who are going to vote right in the coming struggle in a few months, we should also be working on ourselves in that other way, on a vast scale. And uh, by reading her book, you can realize that this is not being done on a vast scale, unfortunately. This struggle against structural racism, it is not. We still, I am still too ignorant about it. And we are still, are still too, too sort of sticky to really face up to it, too fragile. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, we must do it. It's very critical. It's part of the inner work that will go with the outer work of getting back at a more decent government. Okay? So this is not a real whole thing about that. It's just getting started in that. But uh, I think this is really, really important. And for example, in Buddhism, there's, you know, you go to Buddhist centers and there's very few black meditators and teachers. 
and that's wrong. And Native Americans, I, I you could count on a on, on, the, on the one finger, and and uh, that's not correct because it, it they think of it, of course, as a religion, and they have their religion, and they don't want to get involved with that, and they've rebelled against Christianity to Islam quite a lot, which is right, which is fine, but in a way, ignoring that the people who sold them to the Christian ship captains were usually Muslim, but. Everyone is guilty of it all. That's okay. So, but the point is, that's really bad, and we should really work on that. And I have been, you know, teaching, doing too many jobs, and saving Tibet, and teaching at the university, and trying to build up a thing to save the Tibetans and so forth. And I haven't done enough in this other direction about our own country, and I really must do that. You know, I've had the resolution to do it for some time, but I haven't done it. But now I'm going to get going on doing it, and I'm going to right away do it through podcasting, getting people, Buddhist people or whoever watches my podcast into it with me. We really have to look at it. And the first step might be look at this book on white fragility by D'Angelo. And the first name is, I'm sorry, I'm, it's in the phone because I have it on, on the Kindle. It's something D'Angelo. We'll, we'll put the link in the podcast. Okay. Uh, but you, but that's a very important book. I really admire her work. I need to be in, in her workshops to to uh, have it more applied to myself. But uh, you know, I don't pretend I know it all. That thing. On the other hand, last thing, there is something that Buddhism can contribute that isn't just meditation to this question, which has to do with Buddhism's consummate psychology about identity formation, identity. Um, um, boundary expanding, identity transformation, and uh, how identity is structured, formed, recreated, the impermanence of identity, the ability to achieve resilience of identity, and overcome such fragility and so forth, sort of broader thing like that. There, th This would be very helpful in this sort of broad scale education and therapy about this. And uh, But first I need to work on it more myself just in what they have going, and then figure out how to fit the Buddhist thing more with it, the scientific Buddhist thing, not religion, scientific Buddhist thing. And that I vow to do, and I promise you more podcasts in that direction, okay? Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in this week. And as a special bonus, I'll be posting the full unedited ninefold breath meditation that Bob recorded that's a little bit longer than the second half of this podcast would allow. So be sure to visit bobthurman.com later this week and subscribe on your favorite social media platforms. If you'd like to reach me, Justin Stone Diaz, I can be found on most social media platforms as Justin Stoned. I can be also be emailed directly at justin at menla.org. Thanks for tuning in, and Tashi Delek.